Hello, early birds who are already here. Thanks for joining me on my Sunday activity of restringing my cello. So I'm just gonna finish getting everything set up and uh, wait for some people to get here. I'm gonna go live on Instagram also, but if you're a regular to my streams, you know that my YouTube is my priority. Hello, Vivian. Thanks for joining. Still trying to get everything set up here so I can see you guys talking while I'm doing this. Okay. Might have maybe gotten it going. Okay. Hello everybody, thank you for joining. I am restringing my cello today. Feel free to talk in the chat. I figure people are gonna have a lot of questions about gut strings and how they're different than steel strings and lots of things. So feel free to ask questions, chime in, whatever, or just watch the process, whatever suits your fancy. All right, I'm gonna wait just another minute to let people get here. This was a little bit last minute on my part to do this stream. Hi, Instagram, if you're watching on Instagram. These are the strings in question, which I will talk all about. Okay, if you're tuning in on Instagram, just so you know, I'm primarily doing this stream on YouTube, um, so I won't be able to watch the Instagram comments. So if you wanna join me, there's a link to my YouTube channel in my profile, also in my story that I just posted. So come over to YouTube if you wanna really interact. Alrighty. Uh, Frank, that's a funny coincidence. I guess today's the day for restringing. My strings that are on here are probably about a year old, but really good gut strings, as long as your hands aren't really sweaty. Um, gut strings can last that long, but the sweat really does kind of um, break them down, as well as really extreme temperature and humidity. So if you take good care of your instrument and you don't have really sweaty hands, you should be able to get a year out of good gut strings, uh, but sometimes strings go false, which is a whole another problem, but we won't get into all of that just yet. Okay, just gonna wait a couple more minutes. Thank you guys for being here, and we will get rolling soon. It shouldn't take me too long to restream my cello, honestly. Um, you know, I like my live streams to be like at least an hour long, but um, this might be a quick process. Will depend on how many questions there are to answer. Hi, Instagram. Please join me on YouTube if you're super interested in this because I won't be able to monitor um, the Instagram comments because I'm monitoring the YouTube comments. I am trying to get a slightly better shot here for this, but let's see. Oh well, just gonna leave it. You'll have to come to YouTube if you want to see this in a good light. <laughs> All right. Is it 4.35 yet? 60 more seconds, then we'll really get going. Okay, A432, well, I'll be, I'll be doing this at A415. That's my default. Uh, for those who don't know, the 415 pitch is just a half step lower than the regular A, so it's like a G sharp. And that's the kind of go-to Baroque pitch on period instruments. officially five minutes in, let's get into it. So, like I said, strings on here are about a year old and they didn't even sound terrible, you know, they were still doing okay. But I got a new set of strings and I think it's gonna be really inspiring for me to get them on. New strings, the same thing goes with steel, but especially with gut, they need to be broken in to an extent, especially the bottom strings, because as you can see, if you're not super familiar with gut strings, and this is why I wanna make sure you guys can see this, um, 
So the top two strings, the A and the D, sorry Instagram, I know you can't see this, so come to YouTube if you want to see it. Um, the top two strings are what we call open gut, just plain gut strings. The bottom two are wound with silver on the outside, um, which makes them a little bit more stable because a really thick gut string will just change so much as it absorbs moisture and dries out. Um, so you get a little more stability with the silver wrapping around the string, but the silver wrapping does take some time to break in and gets kind of a metallic sound when you first get the strings and the core of the string doesn't really ring so much. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. If you get a new set of gut strings, especially the bottom ones need about a month really to um, be fully broken in. And maybe actually, even though I'm about to take these strings off, I'll play on them a little bit. You can see if you hear a difference when I put the new ones on, um, but it's gonna be such a long process in between that you may not remember what these ones sounded like, but couldn't hurt. So I'll just play a little bit on these strings before I rip them off. Um, so I don't know if I, how much music I'm gonna be playing today because what I'm doing today is restringing my cello. And um, once you put new strings on, as I will demonstrate once they're on, they go out of tune a couple bow strokes and they're out of tune. So they're not really playable when you first put them on. You pretty much have to be cranking and retuning every 30 seconds. Um, so I won't be able to play too much today, but I thought it would be cool to show you guys the whole restringing process. string player Damien which are the strings I've been using let me get this right there you go the strings that I've been using since 2008 when I first started oh it's backwards on the story isn't it oh well gotta come to YouTube guys youtube.com slash Emily plays cello slash live um, I've been using Damien strings since 2008 when I first started playing on gut strings um, I've played on other strings on other people's instruments, but I haven't even bothered to buy another set because I love Damien so much and they're so good and he's a really awesome guy, like a one, one person operation and he does an amazing job. We'll answer all your questions, give you recommendations on what gauge to get because that's a common question when you buy gut strings, you have to choose the gauge of how thick the string will be. Um, so yeah, for a lot of people, they don't know what to do and Damien's just super helpful so I really if you're thinking about getting gut strings for your instrument, violin, viola, bass, whatever, I would certainly recommend him. The link to his website is in the description. Um, uh, yeah, so the idea of waiting after you put the new strings on, I'll often do that, like I'll do kind of what I'm doing now, like restring my instrument in the evening, so then the next day it'll at least have overnight to kind of sit there. You still have to be constantly retuning when you put new strings on, but at least if you can do it at some point, you shouldn't do it right before you need to play because you're not gonna be able to play. You're gonna be retuning the whole time. All right, let's get into it, huh? Um, so the name of the strings, Instagram people, um, DamienStrings.com is the website for the gut strings that I use. He has a hard to pronounce last name. You probably can't read this because it's backwards on Instagram. He's the best though. Um, so if you're curious about gut strings, I definitely recommend him. Okay, can't put it off any longer. Gotta start cranking these pegs. So, for newbies, people who don't know a lot about restringing an instrument, you can't take all the strings off. The bridge will fall. The bridge is not glued to the instrument, it's just held by tension. So you have to take one string off at a time so that the other strings are holding the bridge in the right place. Um, and I always start top down, and that's what we're gonna do. The only real difference is, um, of putting gut strings on versus steel is that the tail piece is much simpler. No fine tuners down there. It's really just a hole where I weave the string through. Uh, and that's really the main difference. It's not too different than putting steel strings on. So let's get into it. Starting with A. Here we go. If you're curious about gauges on um, if you play on gut strings and you're a cellist and you're not sure what gauge to get, I'll tell you all my gauges. 23 and a half for my A. 
I like thicker gut strings. Some people, when they first switch to gut from steel, they feel weirded out because the strings can be thicker. I like the feeling of, and the sound of a thicker string. All right. Plank, and there goes the A string. I'm gonna do my best to show you guys. I wasn't sure how to do this with the camera, like what you would wanna see or what would be most useful. I might at least move the camera down a little bit. Let's see. Kind of depends what I'm showing you. So I'm starting up here and just releasing the string. So just undoing the peg and pulling that baby out. Oops, there goes the peg. As I was looking and studying the string, I think it's really fascinating to see what the gut string looks like once you take it off the peg, especially after it's been there for a while. It's kind of like fossilized. You can see it's sort of like broken in certain areas. Kind of interesting. And pro tip, used gut strings make great cat toys. We'll see if Daisy makes herself known today. So now it's out from the top and I dropped the peg on the floor, but I have a carpet, it's okay. Stick the peg back in. And then I'm just coming down here to the tailpiece where the string is now hanging out of and I'm just gonna push it through. Some gut strings that you buy, I've heard, don't even have a knot tied, like they're just a completely, just a straight, literally just a string. But uh, Damien, where I get my strings, he ties a little knot, let's see if you can see this, at the end. And that's what keeps it in place. All right, so there's my A string. So realistically what I do um, is I don't, only if the strings are really awful do I let Daisy have them for toys. But these ones are actually not sounding even that bad. So I am gonna keep this. I'm gonna put it in the old, in the envelope where the new string is. That's how I organize my backup sets, because you never know. Oh, this is so beautiful, a new string. What's also really cool about gut strings is the color can really vary. Here's my old one, pretty light. Here's the new one, totally dark. Oh, here's Daisy, she must have heard me, she'll come. So yeah, see Instagram light, old string, new string. Okay, so the old one is going away. Into the envelope. So we start, here it is coiled up, we got the knotted end and the regular end. All I'm gonna do is just feed it through the hole of the tailpiece from the back side. So I'm going to go underneath here, feed the string through, once I pull it all the way through it'll hit the knot, there we go, and now bringing it up to the peg. So I wonder if I can get the camera really on this because I would love to sort of show this part, but it might be too difficult to do with the webcam, let's see. So the peg box is a scary, complicated place with a lot of strings weaving on top of each other. Oh, uh, hold on. Okay, hopefully you guys still hear me okay. I had one of the microphones turned on. What an extra microphone. Um, so what we're trying to do when we uh, wrap the string inside the peg box is we want to make sure that the string is a good distance from the side of the peg box, like wherever we wrap the string around. So again, I know it's a little hard to see in here. Basically, if the string is wrapped way too close to the peg box, looks like my C is pretty close, it's not too close, but pretty close. If it's way too close to the peg box, um, the peg will get stuck and be very hard to turn. If it's too far in on the peg, like if that, where you can see that silver part of the C string wrapped around, if that were like more inside over on this side, then the peg would slip out. Every time you'd go to tune, the peg would slip. So you have to find kind of that perfect happy medium where you're close to the end of the peg box, but um, not so close that it's jammed up. And that's what's gonna make it easy to turn your pegs because remember on Broke Cello, you are turning the pegs to do all your tuning. So it's really important that your strings are wrapped well up there because on a modern cello, you can just go down to the fine tuners. It doesn't matter what you got going on there because you barely touch the pegs to begin with. 
But on Baroque instruments, when you're always using those pegs, your wrapping really matters. I see a lot of new people playing on Baroque instruments wrestling their pegs. They go to tune, the string slips out completely out. They can't move the peg. It's almost always the wrapping. So making sure it's not jammed up against the peg box, but it's also not far in on the peg. Got to find that happy medium. So that's what I'm going to now do. And you just feed it in through there. Now, sometimes when I first put it through, um, through the hole in the peg, let's see if I can show it. Um, I try to actually bend the string, like it'll go through the hole and then I bend it just a little to make it a little more secure in there. So, let's just focus on getting this done because there's only so much I can really show you. And then, you know, you try to do a nice, neat job coiling it up. And you just go and go and go until the string starts getting to where it belongs. And then, you gotta really make sure you're over the bridge properly. There we go. And as we're doing all this tuning, and uh, we're gonna be, you know, constantly cranking the pegs, trying to get the string in tune, you have to keep your bridge in mind because all the tuning of the pegs is gonna pull the bridge up this way. So we'll have to be actually very gently pushing down on the bridge that way to make up for all the pulling we're gonna do with the pegs. And you've probably seen people with warped bridges, that's very common on instruments. And a lot of times it's from a lot of tuning and not adjusting the bridge accordingly. So another thing you wanna do is not just immediately crank the string all the way up to an A. You wanna like give it Give it some time. So now it's on the instrument, but it's of course not at all the right pitch. So let's grab an A from my trusty tuner. I just use this Korg metronome box, but what I like about it is, um, I'm gonna move this back. Um, what I like about it is it can give me drones of any note and it does pitch calibration. So like, I'll turn the sound off. I have this set to a 415A, but if I wanted a four, or what's, what do we always, 430 we could say for classical, if I wanted a 430A, could just dial it right up to 430. And then I have all my pitches, you know, relative calibrated to the right thing. But anyway, we're doing 415, that's the go-to. So when I'm just, anyone who knows about pegs, you have to push in as you turn. And notice how I'm going gradually. gonna give like I mentioned a little gentle push on the bridge you can hear it crank a little bit because you know it did get pulled from all that tuning I just did on the A string all right and one string down this isn't that hard right um, but it's gonna go out of tune so quickly all right let's find our D string here we go the gauge for my D is 29 if you are Curious about gauges. So now, get the D string out of here. And you guys, don't be shy. If you feel like talking in the chat, saying hi, please do. Otherwise, it feels like I'm just talking to myself, which is okay too. Tips for people who have never played on gut strings before. Um, so, I have so many tips. And I also have videos on my channel too about playing on gut strings, especially if you're new to it, um, because they do require a different technique. You know, they're still strings. They're not, it's not another planet, but it definitely, to get a good sound, requires 
a different set of skills. The biggest thing with gut strings um, is that you can't overpower them. Like if you have a really good modern technique and you're used to playing really fast bows, like quick bow speed, um, gut strings don't like that. You have to go slower to really get the core engaged. So getting used to a really slow, almost like sticky, crunchy bow stroke is actually what gets gut strings to sound the best. Because if you do a fast whoosh bow on a gut string, it'll just squawk, it doesn't work. So basically getting used to a slower bow speed is the biggest part of playing on gut strings that's different. Okay. Hey Instagram, if you want to join me on YouTube, I'm really mostly hosting this on YouTube. Uh, and there's a link in my story right now and in my profile. Okay, G string. Oops. This is what happens when I try to like look at 20 things at a time. Um. Okay, so here we are, down to the tailpiece, speeding it through the hole. All these strings feel this the feeling of a new string under my hand it's so silky and clean it's actually making me very excited to play really nothing like new strings to make you want to practice i mean you got to let them have their day to settle because like i mentioned they're going to be going out of tune like crazy for the next at least 12 hours or so but then it's fun fun times i mean like i said the bottom strings still need to be broken in that'll be a process but the, the top two, A and D, are gonna sound great, you know, as soon as they're stable and able to stay in tune. So, I am excited for that. And then no excuses, you can't blame your old strings once you have new strings. Though, to be fair, if we're talking about instrument maintenance, I do need a bow rehair also. I'm due for a lot of instrument maintenance, but one thing at a time. Already now that I've got it on with some sort of tension, pushing the bridge. Yeah, you hear it anytime you're doing a bridge adjustment. As soon as I learned how to do a bridge adjustment, like not a serious kind of adjustment, but just the kind of thing you can do yourself, I always do it because bridges warp so easily with tuning. And all you really have to do to adjust a bridge is really gentle. Like what I'm doing is just gently pushing on the bridge and because it's already getting pulled by the strings I hear it click right back into place when I do that so you really don't have to do anything crazy but just like making sure that your bridge isn't getting pulled any kind of crazy way um, is good for keeping it straight okay so now that I have the D on there too I'm gonna take an A from my tuner by the way uh, I mentioned this tuner um, and I now have this new little Amazon shop that has just all my favorite little items that I use, my favorite rosin, my favorite edition of Solo Bach, this tuner, just like some of my supplies that I use. I have a little Amazon shop now, so if you're curious about any of that stuff, link for that is also in the description of the video. Um, okay, let's get an A again. tuned a couple seconds ago and it's already flat. Okay, now that I'm somewhat in tune, I'm gonna push on the bridge again. Do you hear that? That's the sound of the bridge going back in place. Um, all these strings are so beautiful. Look at these top two. They're, they're much darker in color than the ones I had on there before. Okay. Um, yep, so this tuner, I mentioned it, it's a Korg. It's actually technically a metronome, um, but like I said, it plays drones every note in the scale. So really handy 
because uh, I used to, when I was uh, like in college and stuff, practice my scales with drones on this thing to help with intonation, which is really great practice. Um, so I love that this plays drones. It has a volume control too. So it gets pretty loud or you can do it pretty softly. And then what I really like about it that I mentioned earlier, the pitch calibration. So I have this set to a 415. You can set it to almost anything. So I love this and it's in my Amazon store, which is linked in the description of the video. And now listen, my strings are already out of tune. That's what happens. If you ever have to put a new string on, gut or steel, um, in an emergency, always tune a little sharp, a uh, little above, because it's always gonna, the string is basically used to sitting in its little like envelope, not being stretched on an instrument. So when you first put it on the instrument, it's not used to being stretched that much, so what it keeps trying to do is get back to its loose state of sitting in the envelope with no tension. So it's going to go flat over and over again. It's going to go low when it's new. Um, so if you have to emergency put a new string on and you're like, oh no, I need it to be in tune, you might as well tune it a little too high because it's going to only just slip down and get lower. Okay. See, this is going quick. We're already halfway done. On to the G. Okay, and hello everybody who has joined on the later side, in case it's not apparent what's going on. I am restringing my Baroque cello with gut strings, made by my friend Damien, he's the best. If you're, uh, you know, looking to get gut strings or try out a set on your modern instrument or whatever you want to do with gut strings, I highly recommend him. Um, the link to his website is in the description. And yeah, this is just what I'm doing on Sunday, putting these new strings on, which there's really nothing like putting new strings on. I think probably any string player knows. New strings are not cheap, um, especially a whole new set. And we really only do it, most people restring every four to six months. I go even longer, like an entire year. Um, though these strings can last that long, which I mentioned at the beginning. Um, but it's, it's a ceremony when it happens. It's exciting. You know, you know you're going to get a great new sound. Like, new strings are a fun time. So I wanted to share that experience with everybody. Okay, and the silver wound ones are always, to me, a little harder. Like, they just don't slip through quite as easily sometimes. Okay. Hi, everybody on Instagram. I'm mostly doing this stream on YouTube, so feel free to come over to YouTube because I am checking the YouTube comments. I can't check the Instagram comments also. So please join me on YouTube if you want to be a part of the discussion. Okay. What just happened? Where's my G? What did I do? Here it is. Okay, so the old G is going in the envelope as a backup set. Always have a backup set. You don't want to learn that lesson the hard way. Okay. Time for the big guns, the bottom string. So yes, as you can see, silver on the outside of this one, not steel. You know, it, it looks to the naked eye like a steel string, like a regular steel string, but it's silver. No steel in box time. And you know, if you didn't know this, they were using gut strings up until about the 1920s. So I know like when we play like you know, Shostakovich or Brahms or anything, you know, a lot of people think, oh, you have to play steel strings for that. Gut strings are only for Baroque music, but gut strings were the main strings still through the 20th century. Um, okay. It's also nice to do this restringing process when there were no broken strings involved. Oftentimes when I'm putting a new string on a cello, it's because one of my students broke a string. So that's always a little sad, but it happens. All right, we are already so far out of tune. We gotta get back in touch with reality via the tuner. Yeah, and you'll notice what I'm doing is I'm not just taking the pitch of the string I just put on. Like, for example, I just put G on, um, but I didn't 
just take a G from the tuner. What I actually do is I just check it relative to the other strings, and if the other strings are out of tune, I just start from A again, because it's just good to keep tuning the strings. It's just gonna get them adjusted that much quicker. So now, even though the G is God knows where, I'm still gonna get take an A and tune the A and tune down that way. So here how much lower the A has gotten in just those couple minutes. Let's do a little bridge press. Okay. And now we're on to C. Look at how quick that has already gone. Good solos to, le to learn during high school. Um, totally depends what your playing level is and what you've already played. In high school, that's four years. That's a, that's a wide ability level. Um, but the Bach cello suites are always a good thing to play once you're, you know, getting a little bit more advanced. My college audition repertoire was the third Bach cello suite, yeah, third, and the Haydn C major concerto. Okay, off with the C string. And the C string is always massive. Got to pull it out. Yeah, and even getting it through here is a little bit of a challenge. To. How are you spending your Sunday evening, if it's evening for you, other than watching this really fun restringing process? Okay. Okay, Instagram is asking about this metronome that I use. Here it is. Um, I have an Amazon store that has all the stuff that I use. So you should go to my Amazon store if you want to know about all the stuff I like. What is that link? It's in the description of YouTube, but let's see here. It's something easy. Amazon.com slash shop slash Emily Plays Cello. That's what we got. All right, where's my C envelope? Here we go. Last one. Oh, oh, G silver. For a second, I thought I had two G's. Wouldn't that be something? Okay. Here we go. It is time. Um, yeah, so my bridge is technically a Baroque bridge. So yes, it will look a little different. Um, Baroque bridges are typically lower and kind of shaped differently because they're not designed to project as much and they're, they're built around a shorter bass bar or a sound post inside the instrument because Baroque instruments don't have as long as a sound post. Ooh, there goes the string. I'm, I didn't do a good job coiling this, so I'm gonna do that over. And yeah, that's another pro tip when you're putting your strings back in the envelope. The C string, as you can see, it's really thick. It's all curled up, keeps snapping in every direction. So I try to coil them around my hand, get some sort of little coil shape when I put them away. Okay. There goes that. All right, C string. And let's hear out of tune the other strings I've already gotten. Oh, not that bad actually, just the G. Yeah, 
Yeah, so these are, I don't even know how they're different. So Damien and I, Damien is the guy who makes the strings. He likes to send me like newer kind of types of strings that he's making and have me give him feedback. So these ones are somehow different than the ones he sent me last time. But how exactly, I am not even sure. But I will find out after playing on them. Okay. Save the hardest for last, doing the thick C string. strings, the thicker ones, where you can end up with uh, wrapping the string, like I mentioned earlier, too close to the peg box, and then it becomes really difficult to turn the peg. So usually when I wrap my lower strings, I try to make sure there's like just the tiniest little bit of space between the wrapped string and the edge of the peg box. Wow, that string went right in tune. Miracle right there. Okay, and we're going to do another little bridge adjustment. Not too bad, because I didn't have to do too much cranking. All right, let's get an A and tune up again. Okay, wow, can you believe it? We're already done. Check my bridge. I always do this. I so recommend this. I try to look at my bridge from this angle as much as I can to make sure that it is truly, I'm trying to get a good angle with the camera here, truly perpendicular um, to the instrument. Notice how it's not getting pulled in one direction or the other. And that's from all those little bridge adjustments that I've been doing because the way bridges are, they're somewhat malleable, at least for a while. So if, this, if you do a bunch of turning with the pegs and you end up, you know, really cranking and then getting your bridge pulled up that way, as long as you do it in a timely manner, a little bit of pressure, you should be able to push that back the other way. Or if you're on a modern instrument and you're always tuning with the fine tuners, you'll probably find that your bridge is warped in the direction of your fine tuners. Um, but if you catch that early enough or you're just doing regular maintenance, checking your bridge and little gentle pushes, um, you'll be able to keep it straight because it is somewhat malleable. But if you ignore it for a long time and the bridge is warped in a certain way, it will eventually get like kind of stuck in that position and be warped. And then at that point, you have to get it repaired or there are kind of do-it-yourself ways to repair it, but I don't totally recommend those. Um, but yeah, it gets worse over time. So it's worth it to always be monitoring your bridge and making sure it's still straight. Really affects the sound of the instrument if the bridge is warped. Okay, should we hear these strings with the bow? They're gonna go out of tune so fast, but we might as well hear them. I'm gonna turn the microphone down a little bit because usually for the cello, I don't want it too loud. see just how fast the strings go out of tune. Is this a good angle? Good enough. Let's get another A. string the a string was already out of tune <laughs> so that's how fast the strings go out of tune when they're new 
It's part of the process. So I'm gonna do some more tuning. And now I moved it and I can, one day I'll get my camera in just the right spot. just slipped I got nothing so and I was this I'm glad this happened because this is what I wanted to mention once you start tuning with the bow and tuning the pegs if you didn't do a great job wrapping one of the strings it will become known once you start trying to use the pegs um, so what that tells me that the C string slipped out is that I actually left a little bit too much space when I wrapped this oops when I wrapped the string around the peg so now um, I am going to make sure it's a little closer to the peg box so it doesn't slip out, and then I'll tune it again. All right, back with the bow, some more tuning. okay now that I turned it down for the cello just let me know if it's way too quiet or too loud or anything like that um, and if you join on Instagram this stream is really happening on YouTube so be sure to head over to YouTube if you want to join the convo um, okay do I use peg paste I don't um, my pegs are in good shape and assuming you've been to you know a luthier's looked at your instrument and made sure everything's okay with your pegs I don't think you should need the maintenance. It really comes down to the technique of using the peg to tune and just knowing how to do that and having practice doing that. Um, plus making sure your string is wrapped properly like I just talked about. Um, so with those factors and assuming your pegs are in good shape, I don't use anything extra, any products or anything. Um, to get a good sound with gut strings actually doesn't have to do with contact points so much. I think a lot of times we think that people are playing uh, with um, like playing with a higher contact point, um, maybe because fingerboards are shorter and you're able to come up more uh, without playing over the fingerboard. But uh, no, it's not really about contact point, it's about speed, mostly bow speed. Um, and I mentioned this earlier, getting a good sound on gut strings is more about a slow bow speed where you really get into the string and get the core ringing. A fast across bow stroke will often just make the string squeak, it won't sound good. sounding really good so I'm curious actually what about these lower strings is different than the ones I had before they seem a little thinner than the ones I had before but what I'm noticing is that they do have a little bit of the metallic sound that I mentioned that kind of goes away as you break them in um, but they still sound pretty good already take that back they actually don't sound as metallic as some other new lower strings that I've had but they sound a little bit like a little muffled um, and that's something that as the string breaks in it begins to project more and the whole core of the string gets ringing and right now it sounds a little bit still in its cocoon so a little bit of playing and these bottom strings will open right up and these top ones sound
wonderful, loving it. Um, okay. Well, I would love to play, but my strings are gonna be constantly going out of tune. <laughs> for a little bit. Maybe I'll play a little and I'll just kind of stop and retune. Um, but yeah, I thought this whole process was going to be pretty quick. I guess it's been about 45 minutes. So um, now the new strings are on. A new chapter has begun with fresh strings. Again, like I said, the strings that were on here were a year, about a year old. Maybe older? Wow. Yeah, I think they were older than a year. So those strings, been through a lot, but I've been through a lot in the last year, and I'm ready for my new chapter with my new strings. So, yeah. Um, the core of the string, you know, sometimes we talk about the core of the sound. It's really just getting the entire string vibrating, which therefore gets the instrument vibrating. The opposite of playing without core is like a very surface, kind of airy sound. Playing with core means the entire string is vibrating, you're getting full resonance, etc. This is, I have, so the strings on the bottom are silver wound gut, which is all I've ever used. I've never used open gut G and C, and I've never even seen open gut G and C on a cello. Sometimes I'll be able to gamba, I know that they'll sometimes have a pure gut string on some of the lower ones, but for cello I've only seen silver wound for C and G. Um, but they are all gut. All right, what else to do but Bach, right? So maybe I'll play just something low key, first suite. Where is my Bach is the question. Anybody else lose their Bach cello suites three times a week? They're just always going somewhere with me, so it's just easy for me to lose them. Here we go. Also, if you're curious, curious which edition of solo Bach I use, which is a question I get all the time, um, besides referencing uh, the, the manuscript, um, I use the Baron Rider Urtext edition, which again is in my Amazon shop, link in the description. Um, these strings that I'm using are gut strings made by my friend Damien. And there we go. His website is also in the description of the video. stream on YouTube so if you have questions please head over to YouTube and I will answer them there youtube.com slash Emily plays cello slash live So, yeah, I definitely, so what you're talking about, Alan, the difference um, of the, the silver and the gut reacting, I definitely had that problem. When I was living in the East Coast, weather conditions were a little bit more of a concern because there were just more weather extremes, especially in the wintertime. Um, and I really remember that sound in like brutal winter when the silver would separate from the gut and you'd get like a rattly bad sound. Um, usually a little bit of olive oil is what I would do because it's usually I think a problem of lack of moisture. 
Um, so oiling the strings I found helped with that. Um, but the winter, honestly, the, the extreme changes are just bad for gut strings. Really, really humid is bad. Really, really dry is bad. So a moderate climate is the best friend to a gut string more than anything else. Um, okay. The G just doesn't want to get in tune. I think I'm going to actually adjust a little bit how it is wrapped around here. So now you guys are getting the real trial and error after you put the strings on and you actually start playing and tuning is when you realize, oh, maybe I didn't do such a great job wrapping it. You have to actually put it into practice to really realize that. cello can well not exactly um especially the shorter fingerboard if you're playing some crazy concerto that goes up really high you won't even have those notes so no a baroque cello can't do everything a modern cello can uh it's really used for different things um a baroque cello is really best suited for baroque music go figure also early classical music because this setup of an instrument is more similar to what the baroque composers and the classical composers would have seen in their time um, so it gets us much closer to what those composers would have heard themselves with their own ears and also what they had in mind. Um, you know, think about all the technique that developed through the Romantic era and even past that, the Russian school, you know, of the 20th century. So many things have happened uh, with string playing and string playing technique and even composers pushing the technique of an instrument further. So to try to play Baroque music with all this information and knowledge that came after the music was written is actually a little bit backwards because then we have all this new information that isn't actually relevant to what was going on hundreds of years earlier. So by getting on this earlier equipment and actually kind of immersing ourselves in what was going on when these composers were alive and what tools they were working with when they were writing for these instruments, we do a much better job at really achieving the full musicality of a piece um, as opposed to trying to interpret it through the lens of what happened later. It's a little backwards, if you ask me. Um, I just put new gut strings on my Baroque cello. This whole stream has been on YouTube, so if you really want to watch and know what's going on, you should join me on YouTube, on my YouTube channel, um, link in my bio. Okay, are you guys getting tired of hearing me tune? I actually find tuning, depending on the instrument, to be really relaxing. Like, I love the sound of someone tuning a harpsichord. Some people find it really annoying, but I actually find it a little calming, so hopefully you guys feel that way about listening to me tune every couple seconds. <laughs> despite my strings going out of tune. C really wants to slip, so I didn't do a good job wrapping it. Gotta fix it again. All part of the process. What are the best? 
benefits of playing with Baroque bow um, are playing Baroque with the Baroque bow versus the modern bow. You wouldn't really want to use a modern bow on a Baroque instrument. I've done it when I play like transitional repertoire, like I played some early Beethoven uh, with my string quartet a while back, and uh, the Baroque bow would not have been good for Beethoven, though it was for certain things, but other things you really needed a heavier tip to get the right kinds of bow strokes and articulations for Beethoven because it is a lot later than most of the Baroque music that I play. So I did use a modern bow on my gut-strung instrument when we played Beethoven on period instruments, but in general, um, pretty much always using a Baroque bow on a Baroque instrument. They go hand in hand, as you can probably imagine. Yeah, I think my bridge is pretty pretty settled now. You can see now why I didn't uh, why I didn't plan on playing on this stream because the strings are not at all settled. stop once I feel like they need to be retuned. But just to get a little music going, right? Wouldn't hurt. I'm going to play the Alamans from the first suite. One of my favorite go-to movements. actually played, I can feel how the strings are new and not fully broken in yet. Now I can feel it a little more since I'm actually making myself play notes. Um, yeah, and I actually feel like this is a thinner A string than what I had before. So now I want to check. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it is, I believe. So that 23 and a half that I quoted for my A string is maybe thinner than what I get sometimes. I honestly don't know. I trust Damien so much, he just sends me what he recommends. Um, and I just trust him. Okay. All right, guys, so I made it to an hour. I think I'm gonna end the stream now because there's really only so much that I can do with my strings needing to be retuned every 
couple seconds. Um, let's see. Um, would you recommend a Baroque uh, setup for a beginner who's only interested in playing a Baro in Baroque music? Uh, that's like an interesting question. Um, and I think if you're a beginner and you're really only interested in playing Baroque music and you have an actual Baroque teacher, then yes, I would recommend just getting a Baroque setup. Why waste your time? Um, I had a friend who actually, uh, I think she started on Baroque violin or she would, she did Baroque violin before she even finished high school. And like, it just made such a difference. She knew that's what she wanted to do. So she just dive, you know, dove right in. And I think that's worth doing if that's what you want. Um, though, if you don't, ha if you have a Baroque teacher somewhere nearby or someone that you can take lessons with, you might be limiting yourself getting on a Baroque setup because a modern teacher will not know how to teach you on that equipment. So I think it's important to factor in if you have someone who's going to be able to teach you to use that equipment properly, which is can be hard to find depending on where you're living. Um, do you have any of the suites completely memorized? I probably have the first suite memorized um, and a lot of the second suite. Um, the ones that I've recorded and performed, you know, it's definitely easy for me to, I memorize naturally. Though I haven't performed by memory and I try not to because I just think it's unnecessary stress. I don't think the audience gains that much if you play by memory and I think you take on a lot of anxiety as a result. Um, I think we should strive to not be, you know, eyes on the page like we're sight reading, but if you've been practicing a piece for months and months and performing it, you're probably not looking at the page as though you're sight reading it. You're probably pretty sure of what's coming next. Um, so yeah, so I don't perform by memory very often, um, but I do kind of naturally memorize, so at least some of them. Um, <laughs> play Elgar on Baroque cello, that would be a bit intense. Um, but I think gut strings on Elgar would actually be pretty cool. Um, Yeah, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna play the Elgar or anything like that. <laughs> I'm out of shape on that kind of stuff anyway. I never play repertoire like that anymore. Um, okay, so let's see. Maybe I'll play the ending of the Alamond since I played the first half. I'll play the second half of the Almond. If you guys have any lingering questions or anything like that, uh, feel free to ask them now as I'm playing and I'll get to them after. Um, thank you guys so much for watching me do this. I try to do these live streams now at least once a month. Um, so you definitely want to make sure you're subscribed to my channel because I do think it emails you when I go live. Um, if you super loved this stream or found it informative, you can give me a little tip on my GoFundMe. Um, the link is right in the description or you can become a patron on Patreon. I have a great group of people on Patreon who help support uh, my videos that I put out three or four a month. Um, so you can look into those options if you really love the stream or just Keep enjoying the stream for free is a great option too. Um, all right, so I am gonna play the end of this Alamon and then I'll take your last questions. I will see how in tune the strings stay. <laughs> Um, 
underhand bow on Baroque cello. You know, I've never done it. It's certainly intriguing, um, but I, I could see it for certain repertoire for sure, but I think it's one of those things where you really have to address like the region of the piece and when it was written and how common underhand was. Um, I don't think underhand is something that should be just kind of thrown on all repertoire. I think it has to be a pretty informed decision to play underhand on cello. I've never done it myself. Um, what made you play Baroque instead of modern? Um, when I was in college studying to be a cello major, um, pretty early on I felt like I didn't have everything I wanted going on musically. I was like playing in symphony orchestra, I had chamber music, which was mostly like late classical romantic rep. Uh, all the stuff in the symphony orchestra was, you know, late classical romantic modern. Um, I just wasn't playing that much Baroque music in college and I felt like I missed it so much. Um, and we had a Baroque ensemble by a really, who was run by a really great violinist who did a ton of Baroque playing. And he sort of taught all about the historical performance aspect of playing Baroque music. And I was super intrigued by that. I ended up doing a workshop, um, the Oberlin Baroque Performance Institute that summer. And after I did that workshop, it was like sign seal delivered. I knew that playing Baroque music on period instruments was what I wanted to do. No question. Loved the repertoire, immediately took to it. You know, I wasn't really sure how I was doing as a cellist and was well, feeling a little lost. As soon as I found Baroque cello, that totally changed. Um, so for me, it was just no question. I knew I loved it right away. Um, the Baroque cello um, can be used up until late classical, sure. Lots of people do it. The biggest thing that you change when you start doing later repertoire on this kind of instrument uh, is the bow. Because we start to, as we move into the classical period, we start to need a little bit more weight at the bow because we do get different kinds of articulations on this bow that are really suited for Baroque music. And anyone who knows classical music knows that the style in the classical period versus the Baroque period was very different. Um, so a different bow weight distribution um, certainly comes in handy when you get into the later repertoire. Um, but like I mentioned, gut strings were used up until about the 1920s. So gut strings can be used for pretty much all classical music, in theory. Uh, but you don't always want to mix playing gut strings with other people playing steel strings. That gets weird fast. Um, so you kind of have to all be committed as an ensemble or whatever if you want to do that later music uh, in that way. Um, do I find it hard to have no end pin? No, I'm so used to it. Um, it's like holding a violin under your neck or whatever. It's like you get used to the technique that it requires. Um, if you're new to it though, it's always a little hard in the beginning like anything else. I do have a video on my channel and if you guys are curious about Baroque type playing, um, go to my channel and go to instructional videos playlist. There's tons of videos on there about playing on gut strings, playing with a Baroque bow, holding the cello without an end pin, basically all the stuff you would ever need to know. Um, so go check that out. Um, Oh, Daisy's coming over. Come here, sweetie. She's kind of like, who are you talking to? Um, this bow is made by Christopher English. It's African blackwood and just standard 18th century style Baroque bow. Come here, let's see Daisy to wrap up this stream. I can put the cello here. Anyone who's been to my live streams knows Daisy. Come here, sweetie. Oh, that's my little one. This is Daisy. I know you don't want me to objectify you for the viewers. She loves cello. I, when I got Daisy, she was uh, three months old, about that big. And I was preparing for my master's recital. So she had to hear hours and hours and hours of cello every single day from a young age. So she's very used to it and she likes it. And what I actually know from teaching cello lessons in other people's houses all the time, animals like the cello just an animal friendly instrument. It's not too high and shrill, has nice vibrations. Cello is an animal friendly instrument, in case you were wondering. Um, this bow has a screw. Um, I've thought about get, getting like a 17th century short bow, but you know, it's on my laundry list of things. Right now I just need a bow rehair. We're working on that first. But yeah, I would love to have a short bow because I love 17th century rep as much of it as I can play on cello. Um, but yeah, this is just a screw for now. Um. Okay guys, so I think we're gonna call it for today. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. I hope you guys learned some stuff. Um, 
you know, if you end up having lingering questions, you can always just leave them in a comment on the video and I can respond to them that way. And yeah, I will see you guys another time, hopefully another stream coming in November and always, you know, my usual videos that I put out on my channel. Plenty of those. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.